All right, I think that folks are joining us now. Just opening up the waiting room and got lots and lots of people joining in. Want to welcome everybody. This, my name is Micah Parkin. I'm executive director and a founder of 350 Colorado. And um, we have a wonderful workshop tonight, a webinar, regenerative agriculture webinar. And uh, we have Pam Sherman and Wendy Weiner and Amalthea Elwin who are all gonna be presenting. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you presenters and please take it away, Pam. Welcome everybody. Um, before we start, we would like to know how many people are gardeners who are already on this call with us. It would just help us know how to, how to gauge what we say. So how many people are, are gardeners already? And to answer that, let's see. Um, Michaela, can you tell people how to answer that? Sure, absolutely. So you can either click the participants button at the bottom of your page. And if you click that, you should see a raise hand function. If you can't uh, navigate that, the other option would be to click the chat button. And you can just chat in whether or not you have any gardening experience. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay, we'll give people just a, a minute for that. And just a quick little um, note, if everybody, if you can mute yourselves, please, just in case there's some background noise, that would be great. And that we'll have a section later to ask questions of our presenters, or you can, um, you can type your question, any questions you have in the chat as well. Okay, so the second question is, so, hey, oh, lots of raised hands. Great. So the second question is, do you have experience with permaculture? Uh, so you can either put it into the chat or raise your hand if you do have uh, experience with permaculture. Okay, right. Wonderful, okay, well, thank you. So let's, let's get going. I'm Pam Sherman and I am with the 350 Colorado Regenerative Ag and Local Food Systems Committee, as is Amalthea and Wendy is joining us uh, for this introduction on permaculture gardening. As some of you will know, permaculture is actually a design system within which you will find gardening. So gardening is actually happening within a larger system. And let's discover some of that. But first, I, I would like to have the, the panelists introduce themselves. I find it much more interesting when, when I hear Wendy and Amalthea talk about how they came to this. Um, and then we'll start right in with, uh, with what's permaculture. So uh, Wendy, would, uh, would you be willing to uh, just give a brief introduction to how you got into this? Permaculture? Sure. Um, I, um, I had a gardening service for several years where I was teaching people how to garden. I would build their gardens and I'd hold their hands and get them started. Um, I live in Salida now and I'm one of three people that started the seed, uh, the seed library in town and also we are starting a group called the uh, Arc Valley Fruit Tree Network and at, uh, these days just gardening in my backyard and volunteering for a farm in town at a CSA. Thank you. Wonderful. Amalthea? Hi there. My name is Amalthea. Um, I've been doing permaculture for at least 15 years now. Um, it was something that I turned to as a way to help me with, I was suffering from Lyme disease that was undiagnosed and a variety of autoimmune issues. And I realized that clean food really mattered to how well I was doing on a daily basis and how good I felt. And so um, as I turned to organic gardening, I had a hard time doing some of the tilling and things like that because I was still in a lot of pain. And so um, I looked for more efficient ways to do things and that started me down the path of permaculture. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's start. Basically, what is permaculture? What distinguishes permaculture from the kind of gardening system that many of us who grew up with or were taught when we were young. Um, yeah, what, what, what is permaculture to you? And 
Either one. Start. Okay. Um, I'm going to get started here. Um, permaculture basically has three core ethics. Um, it's really a, a means of thinking systemically about how you create change, um, not just in the garden, although gardening is one of the places that it applies, but, but throughout our culture. It's three primary ethics are people care, fair shares, and earth care. And gardening is one of those places where potentially all three can meet, but certainly at least earth care and people care um, because you're feeding people and taking care of the planet in the process. Um, and so that's kind of where we start from. For, this, for the purposes of this talk, we're really just going to focus on applying it to your garden, but there's you know, a great deal of tremendous, awesome information out there about other aspects of this and how to apply, apply it to you know, social interactions and decision-making processes and all kinds of other things for those who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, you're more than welcome to, you know, look for that, dig in deeper with all of that sort of thing. But we're going to focus just in the garden tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wendy, is, is there something you'd like to add to um, why permaculture, how's permaculture different from any other system that, that you uh, might want to talk about? So I would say primarily is that we are working with nature as opposed to working against nature and trying to um, get a stranglehold on nature. <laughs> so we are doing a lot of observing. We're working with uh, what we have in front of us and what already exists and trying not to make it too, um, too different from wh what we already have in our backyard. So uh working with the soil that we have maybe the trees that are there already instead of knocking things down and bringing things in we're going to uh we're going to spend a lot of time observing uh with observing the elements with which we already have to work with so um and when i say that i don't want to i don't want to be exclusionary of any type of gardening but the difference between you know setting up a garden and making rows or building boxes and permaculture is that um the, is both and so we can work with those boxes we can work with um uh, perhaps the garden that's already existing and to bring in new uh bring in other forms of gardening that are going to work more closely with nature and um, like I said, that starts with observation. What do we already have that's existing? And um, and from here, I can we've got uh, some notes. Um, Pam, you want to discuss what we have that we can offer all the participants tonight? Oh, sure. Um, um, if you look in the the first thing in the group chat is um, Google Doc. I posted and it at the end too. Is it the end too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is basically what we what we would love to cover this evening, but realistically in one hour, we're not gonna cover it all. But this is a, right. a checklist for you uh, to take home with you and use it to um, use it for yourselves when you're starting your own permaculture garden yeah. uh, and also for your own research. And, and I'd like to add that uh, for me, permaculture gardening is very much regenerative agriculture applied to the gardening situation. And there's an article in uh, the Colorado Gardener issue that just came out on scaling down from regen ag to regenerative gardening. And to me, that, that's what permaculture is about. And just checking it back, uh, relating it back to what we do at, at 350 on this committee. Uh, it's, it's about one huge thing, it's about soil health uh, because soil is the foundation for everything. Okay, let's get started. Um, Oh, one thing that, that is on this sheet that I, I want, it's really beautiful the way you, you put it, Amalthea. We are going to follow this. this. We're, we're going to follow our outline and you can follow along with us. And um, because we have so much information to give you in so little time and we want to have enough time for questions at the end, we're going to do our best to, to just with um, our outline, which you can all see. All right. Yeah. You just so Amalthea, I'm going to... Um, Start with take time and observe. Right. Okay, so um, when you look at the property that you have um, and 
like I was saying, what exists, you're going to go out and you're going to observe where you have, um, where's your sun? Where is, where's the wind? What are the, um, what are the, the microclimate factors on your property? What are the vectors? Vectors being wind, the sun path, perhaps drift from chemical use. Where's the traffic? Where's the waterways? Where are the animals? If you, like where I live in Salida, we have about 300 deer that own the town. So that's something that we have to work with also. And, um, and with those vectors, uh, how can you work around them? Perhaps, uh, do you have fencing? Do you have hedges? Is there, is there um, how can you position the garden to work with these vectors? Or perhaps to, to keep some of those things at bay? Um, something that's pretty important is, uh, since we're all from different parts of Colorado, uh, you'll need to know what your hardiness zone is. When is your first frost date and when is your last frost date? And, and also we can, we can talk about um, extending the season on either end. I'm a big fan of walls of water, um, uh, using cloches, uh, hoop houses, cold frames, wallapini, which are underground greenhouses, and, um, and also understanding what's appropriate to grow in your zone. If you live at 9,000 feet, is it really appropriate for you to be growing a, a tomato? Or if in fact you do want to grow that tomato at 9,000 feet, what needs to be, what are the foundations that you're going to need to look into so that that's, that's uh, possible? Um, you know, we've got uh, the squash and melon plants. They often struggle with mildew when it's, uh, when um, part of the season has, includes cold nights. Uh, other things that um, perhaps you can, uh, well, well, we'll get into this also about uh, what weeds are, um, are edible, what's in your area, and what are the native foods that work well, and um, foods that are appropriate to grow in colder weather, which a lot of us have to deal with. Anyway, it's a lot, it's a lot to consider, but these are the things that we want to look at prior to, you know, putting your first shovel in the ground. Malfi, do you want to say something about the permaculture principle of long and protracted observation, <laughs> which Wendy was, was actually giving specifics on? Yeah, um, one of the things that, that we believe in in permaculture is that because we are trying to model nature's systems and how nature does the work for you, you have to observe it long enough to figure out how that works on your property. So for, you know, Best case scenarios, we usually recommend that people spend a year really understanding what's going on on your site. Where does the wind come from? Where, you know, what are your problems? What are your, you know, highlights that you can emphasize and, and really figure out how to respond to the place that you're in. Um, obviously, sometimes, you know, schedules change and things have to adapt and, and it's an iterative process where you learn things as you try things and so no matter what you plan for your first outing, it's going to change over time, but it's a good place to start to say, take some time and really observe and watch what it does through some seasons and, you know, continue to adapt that information so that over time you are doing things that are great for the plants and great for the soil and and the critters that visit your yard and that sort of thing. We also like to say the problem is the solution, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so watch where the sun falls. Watch the, with the different angles of the sun, the different angles of the, the tree <coughs> shadows. And uh, because you will be so glad that you did take the time to do long protracted observation rather than rushing into plant and then going, oops, I didn't, I really wanted to grow crops that love full sun, but there's shade here half the day in July. <laughs> so it's really worth it to, to slow down and just take some time outside to just sit and watch and watch the birds and, and see what they're telling you and, and the weeds and the soil. Just look and, and jot things down in a notebook in, in case it was, it's, it's really worth it. Okay. Right. Also, what is, what is growing there now what's already existing like and you can tell a lot about the soil from the types of uh, quote-unquote weeds that you already have okay do you um does either of you want to talk about water because water is so important to life amalpa go ahead 
Um, water is really dependent to some extent on, you know, where you're trying to garden. If you're, you know, out in the, the boonies and you don't really have city water, then you have a whole different set of things to sort of figure out about whether or not your water, uh, your well water is allowed to be used that way. There are some restrictions depending on size of property in Colorado to various uses you can put your well water to. Um, you'll have the option to capture water. Uh, we don't have a ton of rainfall here in Colorado, so you have to be a little bit creative about doing that if you want to use captured water um, and how to make that last. Um, and then if you are capturing it, how much you're allowed to capture, because in some zoning areas, um, you know, you're allowed to take roof runoff, but only so much. And so you kind of have to look into what your local district has as rules on the subject uh, for that kind of water use. If you're using tap water in an urban area, um, you know, you want to know a little bit about whether it's chlorinated, because that may affect some of the plants that you're, you know, working with. Um, and make some conscious decisions there about you know, do I want a whole house filter? That's kind of a lot of expense for a filter, but then I get rid of the chlorine, which will in general help the plants because chlorine is, is a biocide, which will, you know, to some extent kill anything if, if concentrated enough. So there's various things about that to kind of, you know, calculate based on your site and what you're doing um, as to how you can use water in general. In permaculture, we say we like to, um, if it's water, you know, that's not tap water, then we like to slow it down, spread it out, and sink it in because that's going to give you the best retention in your root systems and the more recycling of water within the climate near you and that sort of thing and, and much better results in terms of your plants overall. And also, go ahead, Wendy. I was going to say um, uh, the way that uh, keeping your soil covered, not exposed, is all going to maintain moisture in your gardens. Mm -hmm. And also uh, having lots of plants that take up all the room and, uh, and, and cover the soil and shade things out and also help maintain the moisture in the soil. And, and lots and lots of mulch too. And as your garden uh, goes along from year to year and your soil becomes richer and richer, it will store a heck of a lot more water. Um, I mean, a surprising amount, of, and it will also, at the same time, it will store more carbon, uh, which also helps with climate change. So um, working with your soil and your water is, is key. Um, I think we need to move along here to microclimate factors of your property. Do you think we covered that sufficiently in just touching on it, or do you want to say any more? Wind, uh, rain, I think it's useful to understand that you can, to some extent, alter the microclimates on your site. Um, there are ways to, you know, grow a tree that is maybe one zone off of where you live um, with putting a giant boulder near it that will absorb heat in the wintertime and keep it just a little bit warmer so that it's, um, you know, going to survive a little bit better right there. Or sometimes like a brick masonry box, things like that can retain a little bit of heat. Uh, a raised bed made out of masonry can give you a little bit earlier season extension based on warming up the soil a little bit more that way. Um, so, so it's worth understanding that you can alter your microclimate just a little bit, um, but that those plants that you do that with will also be a little more fragile. So, you know, be prepared to lose them occasionally if we have a year like this last one with a really early freeze and a really late freeze. <laughs> those can affect things. So. And Wendy, you had mentioned earlier season extenders. Um, if, if you're following along with, with the handout, you can see walls of water, uh, clushes, uh, which can be made out of all kinds of things. Um, milk cartons. Milk cartons, yeah. Right. Uh, hoop houses, uh, cold frames. I don't have no idea, what is wallapini? A wallapini is a Native American technique that is kind of like a greenhouse that's halfway underground. And so you basically dig a hole and you plant into the hole and then over the top of the hole you, you put greenhouse top on it basically. And in terms of, that reminds me of the Oyas, the O-L-L-A, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, that's also a Native American technique. Uh, Amalthea, do you want to talk about that for just a minute? 
And those are the water jars, right? Yes, they right. Bury the water jars in your yard, and they're made of clay, so they slowly seep liquid into your um, system. You can actually make them from two flower pots glued together and plugging up the hole on the bottom. Um, <laughs> and then you can basically plant those near your plants, fill them with water, and it will slowly seep into the neighboring soil. Awesome. Thank you. Um, would you, Wendy, would you be willing to talk about the permaculture function, uh, permaculture principle called stacking functions? So uh, stacking functions is finding more than one use for, uh, for anything. So it's, it's actually what it is, is redundancy. So for instance, um, building a structure on your property, what, how can you use that in more than one way? And we like to have at least three uses. So for instance, um, creating um, a shelter that perhaps you're going to uh, keep out of the sun, uh, a place to uh, wash your vegetables, but also be able to collect rainwater underneath, I'm sorry, from the roof, and also perhaps have it be a place to, uh, for storage. So um, having more than one use for an object, perhaps. Um, also just uh, redundancy in anything that we use in the garden, having more than one use for it. Uh, and that can be true of plants as well as structures. I mean, I have lemon balm in my yard, which is both edible, I can make teas out of it, I can use it to flavor things, but it also distracts bugs from, you know, negative bugs from that particular bed that it's part of and confuses them essentially with the smells. And so they right. don't Comfrey. food. Comfrey is a perfect one that we use. It's a miner. It has a very deep tap root. We use it uh, when it grows really big. We can chop it. We say chop and drop and uh, use it as a mulch around other plants. And as it decomposes, it has minerals in it. Um, and also at, for a lot of, I use it for a lot of uh, medicinal uses in my saps, et cetera. And any kind of the, any of the roots that we grow are miners. So they're going, they're digging, they're keeping the soil loose. They're, um, they're bringing up minerals and parts that we don't use can go right back into the garden or into the compost. Now stacking functions brings me to something else which I don't see on this particular page, but that it's a, a the buzzword that everybody know, a lot of people know and that they're curious about and that is food forest. Um, would one of you be willing to uh, elaborate on that? We can both talk about okay. that. Okay, great. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've started probably three or four food forests on my property. Um, one using hugel culture, and if you're not familiar with hugel culture, it's simply digging a hole uh, to any length that you want. Mine were about 16 feet long, um, and we had a lot of trees on the property because we were burning, and uh, just leftover wood gets dumped into the hole. And then it was, I covered it with, um, I got some poop and then I got the existing soil that I used to dig up uh, the original hole with. And then I went about planting it a uh, food forest. And in the food forest, we have several layers. We try to mimic a forest, uh, starting with the top layer, which is our tall trees, just like you'd see in a forest. And then perhaps medium sized trees. So for instance, um, I planted a, uh, plum tree. And then I would have shorter, uh, perhaps trees that were not as tall or shrubs. So, and for mine, it was all fruits, uh, perhaps um, blueberries, uh, gooseberry shrubs. And then as I would go down another layer, I would have um, vines that would be like raspberries, um, uh, goji berries, a bottom layer, to cover the soil, I would always have uh, comfrey, which I always put around all of my trees at mining I talked about, also for chopping and dropping. Um, other, uh, of course, dandelions, other good miners that are gonna bring up the minerals. And what else did I put in there? Strawberries. 
So you're in this way, you're, um, you're growing a lot of food in one place, but you're having, you're having many different levels. And as the, the plants start to mature over a long period of time, some of them will shade each other out and, and die back, which is what would happen naturally in a forest. And some things will get very big and some things that, um, depending on how much, uh, attention you want to give it, you can, um, as things die, you can add things back. You can remove things. And the thing is, the thing that I want people to remember is in permaculture, there's a lot of talk about, well, I put this in so that I would have to do less work. In my mind, because I'm a gardener, I still want to work. I still want to uh, maintain. And I'm constantly moving and adjusting and removing. And, and yes, I let, I let the, the quote unquote uh, forest do its thing, but um, I, I am the keeper of the garden and I am going to maintain it. Amalta, you want to add to that? I think that was a pretty good discussion of it. You can do it in whether it's started with a Hugo culture bed or not. Um, you know, I certainly have, like my front yard is on the north side of my house and, and I have some neighbors who are a little too nosy. So, you know, I didn't want to shade out the whole space and make it so I could only grow shade stuff. But at the back where I kind of wanted a screen, I have started um, a tree line that basically has, you know, some sea berries and various different things to kind of discourage the neighbors from being quite so nosy, but also to create a food forest. So, you know, those are some of my stacking functions there. I, I just want to add also, um, just getting back to hula culture, the, the concept is that as the debris breaks down in, underneath the soil that you've created, you're creating kind of a sponge that's going to hold more moisture and um, hopefully less watering and the plants that are planted in there are going to go seek out the moisture. So in the best case scenario, it's kind of uh, the system takes care of itself in terms of moisture. And there's also an underground forest as well in terms of roots. And I know in, uh, in uh, conventional gardening, we're taught only plant the crop. Do not plant anything else. You have to have a clean seed bed. And that is not the case with permaculture or regenerative agriculture. Um, because roots are of different length and the roots that go very deep will not interfere with roots that are medium length and roots that are uh, a cover, a ground cover at the top. So you're actually creating, you're, you're using the soil at different levels when you, when you have plants that have different root length. So it's kind of like the mirror of a food forest above the ground. And all of these will create a much healthier microbial system of what uh, Wendy talked about in terms of the hugel culture. Um, I find it very difficult to do that because it's just too dry where I am. But if you can keep it watered, that's the key. And when it breaks down, it, it, it's very, very fungally rich. And our soils out here, in, in we're, we're, in, we're so dry here in Colorado that we really have fungal deficient soils. And your fungi are very, powerful microbes in your microbial community you need them badly so we, we the problem is you don't want just bacteria you want the fungi and when you when you put a lot of wood wood in there that breaks down you are feeding the fungi and you will have very rich rich fungal soil so that's um wonderful okay so uh, creating soil for the first time lasagna gardening amalthia well, we talked about, um, as we kind of laid things out, that there were several structures you can start with. I mean, there's everything from just planting straight into the ground to doing raised beds, which I do a number of because I'm also disabled in a number of ways. And so it's much easier for me to just, um, rather than, you know, having to get down at ground level. Um, there's also Hugo culture beds, which we've just covered, and lasagna beds, which are kind of a, a quick way to alter, you know, if you've got suburban grass that you're trying to get rid of or that sort of thing, lasagna beds can be a great way to deal with that. Instead of using landscape fabric, which doesn't break down, you can use something like cardboard as your underlayer. Uh, make sure you overlap the edges of it, but lay it on the bottom and then um, you can cover it up with layers of 
to some extent, anything that you have available uh, in terms of soil or yard clippings or that sort of thing. You don't want lots of seeds to show up in it necessarily. So be a little conscious of that. But, um, and then basically over the top, you probably want to mulch it because everything is trying to leach your water out here in Colorado. <laughs> and so you want to make sure that you're keeping your moisture in. Um, it's also great to add in there some layers of compost, some layers of you know, manure if you've got some nice aged manure, those kinds of things can all go in that bed on top of wherever you want to cover up, you know, something that was just not what you wanted or is dead or is grass that you don't care about. Um, and then you can plant directly into that. And over time, the cardboard will break down, the worms will work their way up, you'll have really rich soil to work in. Okay, um, do, you, do you want to cover soil amendments now? Because that could really take a lot of time or maybe we could I'll cover it later if there are questions. And we'll I just wanted to go ahead. add something else to if you are going to do um, lasagna gardening, and that is to be a good scrappy gardener. And when you see things that are um, on the uh, um, available, like you know how um, after Thanksgiving everybody throws those bales of straw out? Start collecting that. Start saving your leaves from your trees that you've raked up. I like to save the leaves, put them in a plastic bag and run them over with my truck so that um, I can get them nice, nice small pieces, which is a great, um, a great mulch. Also, um, we have so many uh, uh, breweries, start gathering uh, the grains, the spent grains from the breweries. Start, um, I leave, at, at all times I have two five, five gallon buckets at my local coffee shop. Um, and then, of course, if you really get inspired, you can um, go to restaurants and see if you can have some of their some of their scraps. And all that stuff is, it's essentially, lasagna gardening is also considered uh, composting in place. For instance, I took all of my compost or unfinished compost and I, I made three new beds this season and instead of them sitting in a big pile doing nothing, I formed them into some nice beds and and added some amendments, which we can talk about now, but think about, you know, start picking up quote unquote trash or things that people don't want and, and creating piles because there is an abundance out there, a, a real abundance in order for us to make our own soil. Amalpa? In terms of soil amendments, um, I don't want to spend a long time on this, but if you're not sure, if you're just really looking for something off the shelf and you don't understand what you're looking at otherwise, OMRI is a great place to start in terms of a organic plan management uh, uh, certification of that product that nothing totally hinky has happened to it in the process. So that can be something to look for. In general, locally sourced organic stuff is great. Chip Drop is an awesome service that will uh, refer people who are cutting down trees in your area to bring you a whole bunch of mulch to your yard for free. So that's something to look into. Um, but, you know, in general, find what you can locally, get it as, you know, diverse and fungally friendly and alive as you can get it. And that's going to make your best soil amendment. Um, I just want to uh, share with you something else that I did on a property that I had uh, for about five years. I found a, um, this was back east, but I found somebody that would deliver me chips because, um, Oftentimes those trucks are looking for places to dump and I would get 30 yards at a time and I chipped the whole property and uh, unbeknownst to me at the time I was I was growing soil. So there was all the soil was very uh, full of clay and over the years, of course there was more rain there, but you never know in Colorado, just keep stacking those chips everywhere. and. I would want to grow so much stuff in my garden that at one point I would just pull the chips away, put a little bit of topsoil in and plant a bean and it grew. And um, if, if you've ever seen, has anyone ever seen the movie? Um, it started in Eden, I think it is. It's about a, a man that all he does is grow in chips. Has, are you familiar with that, anybody? I've heard of it. Yeah, There's people it, who grow in hay bales for the same kind yeah, of reason. You can use yeah. hay as a mulch as well. I'm right. personally allergic to all of the grass family plants, <laughs> so I've actually, in some of my beds, used alfalfa instead if I needed something nitrogen anyway, and I would use that as a mulch. 
Yeah, that's great. Also, you can buy um, you can buy alfalfa uh, ground up. And I, I just want to say something also about the amendments that we get. And, and you can take this to any level that you want. You can be as scrappy as you want. You can be as clean as you want. But when we start getting quote unquote organic uh, compost and poop, is it really organic? Because I think these feedlots are serving their, <laughs> the menu for the animals on those feedlots are GMO alfalfas, right? And uh, chicken poop, it's coming from, you know, these high density factory farms. So that you can learn about what substitutes or get to know your farmer, or there are sources where you can find clean stuff, but you really have to do some digging. So be aware because that a lot of this stuff is is very persistent in 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 the poop it just stays there it, it some stuff just does not break down sorry for the bad news <laughs> okay uh let's go on to sourcing plants and seeds and i realize that we're we're rushing here but we're almost at our time limit so um wendy and amalthea Say whatever you want to say from the section sourcing plants and seeds. What do you want people to know? And when I would say first, yes, go ahead. First and foremost, uh, we are fortunate enough in Colorado to have many new seed companies. And, and some of them are very small, and a lot of people are starting to um, uh, uh, save their own seed. Uh, uh, Pam and I are both graduates of seed school and we're offering classes and teaching people how to save seeds. We have seed libraries around the state. Um, and uh, you can do a simple search to find uh, seed companies in Colorado that are probably more appropriate. Uh, these seeds are probably more appropriate for us since they've been grown in our bioregion. So there's actually quite a bit available. Amalta? And then if you have trouble finding those, there's always, of course, the bigger sources that do cover things for Zone 5, which is a lot of Colorado and uh, the you know, surrounding zones, um, Zone 6 at this point now, as we've shifted with climate change. But, <laughs> um, but there's, there's Fedco is a great source, which is pretty clear about whether you're getting open pollinated or organic seeds. Richter's has Could a lot of- Could you explain that? Explain that? open pollinated. Um, open pollinated seeds, basically there's a, uh, two choices in most common seed packets of whether it's open pollinated or a hybrid seed that's an F1 seed. And the open pollinated seeds basically mean they did nothing really to control the pollination and make sure it stayed really specific to that variety of thing. You get a little bit more resilient genetics out of that, generally speaking, but um, the reason that they do uh, F1 first generation hybrids is basically because in that first generation of creating a hybrid you get like a, a plant that will just go gangbusters for one year but then you won't be able to really reproduce that effect if you collect seeds from that plant because it was a really specific cross that enabled that unusual behavior. Um, so well, if you're going to collect seeds most of your stuff is going to be pollinated to some open pollinated to some extent and you can do a certain amount to like bag flowers and cross between only the right squashes in your neighborhood and that sort of thing but um, there's there's kind of a difference in how you produce those pollinated seeds and the effects that you get out of them hybrid seeds are often also sprayed with fungicides and other things that you don't necessarily really want in your garden so um, those are worth being aware of as well I'm so glad you brought up the hybrids because you're, you're, that is exactly what you're going to find is what Amalfi has said in the first generation um, after the hybrid is planted and crossed you will not get it to be a breed true to the first but Wendy are you willing to talk just a little bit about how you can work with hybrid seeds <laughs> go ahead so you have to be very patient because if you decide so um, there is a I think it's it's called uh, there's a cherry tomato and or an orange one that everybody sun gold if you might have heard of the sun gold tomato and it's so delicious it's super sweet it's oh it's a it's like an orangey yellow and everybody loves that tomato 
And if you save the seeds to that, it's going to be a little wonky, not necessarily look the same the following year. But if you have the patience and grow it out, what you're going to what you're going to have are several different uh, tomatoes that emerge. And this is what breeding is all about. So you pull out the ones that you don't like or you don't like the taste and you save the one that you, um, that you like its characteristics, you like its sweetness, you like its color, and then save that, <laughs> plant it again next year, and then over, over ensuing years, you might get back to it or you might create something new. But it takes a long time from saving an F1 hybridized seed to get perhaps back to something that you see. So my point is you can save the seeds. You're just not going to get what you grew that first year. Yeah. And you have the possibility to grow it out over several generations and perhaps get it back or something even better. Yeah, it could, it could become, it, it could grow some really neat stuff within three years, um, but it may not be a beautiful, uh, until eight years. It just depends. Um, and the point, I would say the point there is like, just be playful and be patient and perhaps something great is going to, um, come from it. But yeah. that's, that's the whole thing behind, uh, seed, seed breeding. Patience. Uh, okay. We are closing in on question time. Um, but I think it's so super important to just at least touch on plant guilds and protecting the soil. So would one of you uh, be willing to, uh, or both, talk about plant guilds first and then protecting the soil? And then we'll open it up to questions. Martha, go ahead. I think that the really critical thing to understand about plant guilds is that nature kind of abhors a vacuum. And that's why you get your weeds crowding in your sterile soil with a single plant in it. Um, and so what we're trying to do is to understand instead how those plants work together and how they can help each other. Um, one of the things that can really help is to plant nitrogen fixtures, which are also in legume family stuff or clover, um, things like that, that will help to create accessible nitrogen in the soil for the other plants there that draw nitrogen from it. Um, there's also mineral concentration plants that have deep tap roots, like she uh, mentioned comfrey before, and there's a variety of other ones, but like I use horseradish the same way. It's things that have a really deep tap root um, are going to produce a whole lot of biomass for you that's going to be pretty mineral rich and you can chop it and drop it and use it as fertilizer essentially. Um, also things that attract pollinators are really important. So something in your guild that's going to flower and maybe have blue flowers, especially since the bees love that, so that that will attract your pollinators that will pollinate your fruit or whatever else you're growing. Um, also plants that are complementary to each other like um, tomatoes and carrots go grow pretty well together, but there's other kinds of plants that don't do so well together. And so understanding a little bit about companion planting and de different depths of, of root systems can help you to get a better outcome. Um, and then of course, fungal friends. Um, various kinds of fungi can be grown in Colorado. Some of them edible, some of them not so much, but all of them, uh, fungal friends are the greatest things because they're, they're kind of like an internet network under your soil. They actually redistribute resources to the plants as they sort of move through the soil in their web. And so they're, they're really just kind of incredible things to have on your property. So, you know, whether you add your own or just kind of encourage those in your neighborhood that happen after the rain, either way, you're doing a great service to your plants to have those fungal friends and their mycorrhizae growing in your area. And you I think can build it's, plant guilds out of all of that that will then produce much, much greater yield than your, you know, three annual plants that you were going to plant <laughs> in your spare bed with no, you know, covering and, and no companions nearby. It's very easy to find companion planting lists online. Yeah, and there's books about it too, if you want you know, to even yeah. go buy books about it. Yeah. And you can also try and see what works in your garden. And you'll make mistakes. But I like to see whatever seeds land in my garden, I leave them. And I like to see how they work with the crops that I've put into my garden. And sometimes they work well, and sometimes they don't, and I have to rip them out. Um, okay, protecting soil. So we 
to protect the soil, the number one thing to do is to mulch, is to mulch and, um, and add in the things that we talked about, uh, things that you find on, uh, things that you were taken down last year that are added back to the soil, chopping and dropping, um, uh, compost that we make, uh, perhaps um, adding uh, teas to the garden, and what else? Uh, and not leaving open spaces in the garden, trying to cover things up as much as possible. And like, like you were saying, nature abhors a vacuum. You know, what's gonna, perhaps things are gonna come in that you like or you don't like but it's gonna take up space. And when we grow annuals, we're really pulling a lot of minerals and uh, nutrients out of the soil. So uh, that's why you'll see a lot of people um, um, in permaculture often use a lot of perennials so that you're not constantly pulling out of the soil, you're adding to the soil. Thank you very much. Um, this, this uh, we had better stop here for, for questions. and. Before we take the questions, I want to thank Michaela um, for answering the questions in the chat and Micah for answering questions. And Michaela worked on a farm for a year, so she's pretty knowledgeable. And Micah is also a fellow permaculturist. So um, I can't wait to see what your answers are. Um, Michaela, would you be willing to read the questions that you guys haven't answered? Sure. We had a few questions come in from email and then a couple others on the chat. So one question that we got um, was, I, this isn't me, but this person lives in a condo with a very sunny and hot patio. They strive to keep their water use low. What would you recommend that they plant? Uh, is, what's the climate where they live? Is it, is it, okay, you said it's very hot, right? So a very sunny and hot patio. You could try a pepper. <laughs> pepper is like it really hot and and mostly dry, I mean, not too wet. Peppers might work, or also on the deck, you can put uh, some climbing beans. If, are, are, if they're looking for things to eat, I'm guessing, and you can put them, um, if there's a railing, then uh, growing something that's viney, like cucumbers or peppers, cucumbers, peppers, and beans in a pot that can climb onto the rail that is uh, enclosing their deck. Great, certainly, thanks. Certainly herbs, yep. Um, another question that we kind of touched on a bit in the chat, but if you guys have anything to add, that would be fantastic. The question is, what kind of wood chips pull the least amount of nitrogen out of the soil? Interesting question. My understanding of it is that it has more to do with like how new the wood chips are and how much they've broken down. Um, a little bit older, a little bit more broken down wood chips will, generally speaking, leaves less of the nitrogen out of it. That said, if you're planting nitrogen concentrating plants like clover or beans or those kinds of things, like I've put fresh, you know, brand new from the tree company mulch over things and never had a problem with it leaching too much out as long as I also have nitrogen fixers in the soil. If you do discover that you need a little bit more nitrogen, a free way to get some more is to save your milk jug, collect some urine, water it down by half, and pour that on the garden. And, and you know, that way you get a little bit higher nitrogen level. Right. I, I would also um, uh, perhaps think about inoculating those wood chips with some mushrooms, and that will help them. Uh, the chips break down also, and then that's the beginning of creating some soil as well. And I've, I've used all kinds of chips, uh, hardwoods, softwoods, pine, and I never, I never had issues. And right. also, uh, if I did have a bunch of wood chips that I, like I said before, I could pull the chips away, put, some, put a little bit of soil, just enough to grow whatever I wanted to put, you know, beans or a tomato or whatever it was. You can add a little bit of soil. It's just, you know, for that particular year. Great, thank you. Um, so another question that's really interesting, this is from Mary. She says, um, a neighbor provides me with their lawn clippings in a plastic bag. Sometimes it sits around until it's moldy. Is it still okay to use as mulch around my veggie plants? It's I think maybe I would let it sit out in the sun a little bit first. Mm -hmm. I would tend to put it just a little bit further from it, just not to encourage any fungal you know, attachments you don't want to the leaves, but generally if your plant is healthy, 
it, mold is the way that nature cleans up after something that is fragile and already on the edge of dying. So generally speaking, it's not usually going to have much effect unless you were already struggling to keep some plant alive. So it, it shouldn't generally matter, but just for safety's sake, I would probably put it, you know, a little bit further away than right on top of it. And make sure it's they're clean clippings. They're not adding anything to the grass. Right. Um, this next question, I would really like to hear the answer to this one too, because it's something I've struggled with. It comes in from Jane. What is the best approach for dealing with bindweed? Uh, <laughs> that's what I do with it. If you've got deep taproot perennial things growing in your yard, the bindweed doesn't win. The bindweed is winning because there isn't anything with a deep taproot, and so it's pulling all the mineral concentration and strangling things out. I have it in my yard, but I don't do anything to mitigate it other than just out-compete it. Mm. Um, okay, let's move on. Let's see. Um, we James... do have mites for it, by the way. Somebody said oh. that in the chat. You can that, actually order mites for it, but I've never tried it. The mites work for, oh, I was told by an extension agent, the mites will work on the western slope where it's drier, not on the eastern slope where it's wetter. Wow. Is it, Anybody else has more information on that? Please unmute yourself and say something. Okay. Okay, let's zoom along here. And at the end, we have a question for, for everybody here, everyone who's participating. Also, uh, don't yank bindweed because yanking stimulates its root system and makes it grow. So clip it off if you're gonna try to like actually just remove it. That's a great tip, <laughs> thank you. Uh huh. Um, we have another mulch question here. So this comes from Barbara. What mulches are bad to use and good to use? I've heard that cedar and cypress are not good to use. Yeah. Mm. It depends a lot on your circumstances. Like if you're growing, you know, an annual bed of things, then um, straw is great. And a lot of people use that because it doesn't have much impact on the nitrogen in your soil. Um, and, and if you've got an annual bed, <coughs> A challenge but then if you're growing you know I've used whatever random thing chip drop brings to me and it's all been fine in my um, mostly perennial you know fruit zones and things and so it just kind of depends to some extent like there's there's certain um, trees like certain nut trees for example that produce a chemical that makes it hard for other things to survive but walnuts um, you don't really black see much walnut. of that in Colorado so yeah black walnut would be that yeah, black walnut trees. Liliopathic. But Liliopathic. most kinds of tree you can just use. Really quick before the next question, I see Carlton Kulik has his hand up. Did, I don't know if he had a question oh. or wanted to add something. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, let's see, wait, am I muted? Can you hear me? We can yes, hear you. we can hear you. Yeah, I accidentally hit, I was just playing with the uh, settings. Sorry about that, guys. Very oh, no worries. No worries at all. Just wanted to make sure you didn't have something you wanted to add. Yeah. Thanks. I'm impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any next question? Yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> so, um, oh. and the next, I'm just going in order here. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. What perennial vegetables do well on the front range? At what altitude? Um, I'm a mountain gardener. If anybody has any mountain questions, at 8,300 feet. So, you guys, um, and Wendy's at 7,000 and Amalfi is in Denver, so yeah, I'm uh, it depends Ridge. where. So the stuff that I grow in Wheat Ridge, um, I grow horseradish, I grow, you know, I plant, those aren't perennial, but I plant beans um, and clover, which I use some of. There's a lot of herbs that do great here. Um, I've got sage and oregano and tarragon and uh, all kinds of good stuff going on in the, uh, I have thyme as a ground cover all over my front yard. Um, that one just comes back like crazy. So all of those are great. Um, I grow also some self-seeding annuals, which is kind of like a perennial in terms of the effect. Like I grow orach, which will just self-seed. And so I have endless spinach-like um, veggies uh, doing that. Um, I also have a lot of medicinal stuff that is, somewhat edible, like a hollyhock is edible, but most people don't know that, but I add them to my soups and things. So there's a variety of things if you want to go down that rabbit hole that are, you know, great edible plants that maybe nobody knows about. 
Well, uh, certainly there's there's sorrel and asparagus. Yes, and there's sorrel and asparagus, both of which I have. Bloody Dock um, is pretty, and I have some of that. It's awesome. There's a lot of the perennial greens that work here. Um, there's actually a walking stick kale, which I haven't tried yet, but the in theory will work here as well, um, and will come back perennially, unlike most and kales. And onion? Yeah, walking onions, cabbage, yeah. Which is in the celery family, but is a little bit different than celery, and it comes back perennially. Crame um, maritima. The sea kale yeah. uh, just got added to um, Plant Select. Cool. Yeah. So there's lots of good choices um, if you go down that rabbit hole. I also have burdock, which most people don't even know what it is, but <laughs> I love making Asian soups. And so I grow burdock, even though it's huge and ridiculous. Great. Um, I want to go on to the next question, but before I do, for people who have to hop off right at eight, I just wanted to um, ask where people can find this re the recording of this webinar for anyone who wants to watch it later. I can pipe up on that. We have, um, okay. right now it's, it's uh, streaming to Facebook Live on 350 Colorado's Facebook page, so you can go back to 350 Colorado's Facebook page at any time and um, and find it there. And also, um, it's being recorded, so we're going to post it to 350 Colorado's YouTube, and we will put it on our regenerative agriculture page after the event. Not awesome. immediately after; it'll take a little time to, <laughs> to edit it, but we'll get it up there. So you just go to 350Colorado.org to find that and. Um, Look for our regenerative agriculture and local food page. I'll Great. share it out on 350 Denver and 350 Jeffco as well. If you want to find Thank it, you. And I oh, and also at the at the hub, the our hub Facebook page, the Colorado Local Food Systems and Regenerative Agriculture Facebook group, there as well. And um, we also want to ask anybody who needs to leave at eight, uh, and anyone who's staying. Um, Wendy, Malthy, and I would like to know if you would like any follow-up to this. This is just a very quick interview, a, a quick introduction. Do you, if you would like a follow-up of some kind, let us know in the chat group or on the Facebook page, or uh, we could give out an email and just let us know what, what, what you need, what you want. Um, because sometimes it's a little hard to go to an introduction and then it just kind of leaves you hanging. So, um, so you can get back to us at the Facebook hub, uh, or I, mean, I can just give my email out if you want. It's pamsher123 at msn.com. If you want to, uh, to write us that way um, or put it in the chat. Thank you. Well, yeah, we're always looking for ways to develop new talks. So, you know, tell us the subjects you'd like for those talks. And you know, we will, you know, we may not be able to get to everyone, but it helps us to have the ideas to know what you care about and so that we can form those later. Yeah, or, or any other kind of uh, education follow-up, whether it's a presentation or not. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do, I mean, some sometimes, you know, I've been in a gardening group for 17 years and, and it's been, we've learned so much from each other. It's just been amazing. Um, I also am doing this disabled, and so I've actually done some presentations for people about how to make garden uh, access accessible to people with disabilities. So, you know, I'm happy to come do presentations if people have specific site needs that, you know, don't fit within a more general conversation, too. So I've included my email in the chat if you want to reach out to me. Oh, thank you. Michaela, do you want to continue with questions? Sure, yes. Yeah. Okay. So the panelists have generously said that they will stay, be happy to stay on until 8.15, so we'll just keep rolling through questions um, until that time. So the next question comes from Fred, and Fred says, my, my water is ditch water. It comes from irrigated farms up higher. God knows what's in it. Should I worry about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would not necessarily want to plant my, like, you know, direct from the ground food stuff, like right next to wherever that water is running. I would try to like run that water a little bit distant and let it kind of leach through so that the soil is helping to clean it and remediate it for you a little bit. I would say also perhaps um, maybe have your trees closer to it, not necessarily your vegetables. Fruiting plants, generally speaking, are not going to concentrate as much stuff as something that you eat the leaves or stalks of. So, 
um, generally speaking, right next to your water access would be a better place for your fruit trees and that kind of thing. Great. Um, the next question is from Sam and it's about weeds. And Sam asks, do gardeners want lots of we wild weeds to grow? Or if there are too many, are they going to take nutrients from other plants? Great question. We love this question, by the way. The Generally speaking, I really believe most of the time the weeds are serving a purpose. At the very minimum, they're telling you about that soil and what it needs or what it's deficient in. And so you can figure out, you know, what minerals does that dandelion interact with? And that can tell you something about your soil right there. And so that, that being said, I also eat many of my weeds. There's, there's lamb's quarters are in the goosefoot family, which is the same family that spinach is from. Um, I eat those. I eat the little prickly lettuces and the dandelions and all those things. Um, I will say if you're going to eat lots of your weeds, generally before they flower and seed is, is going to be a lot less bitter. Um, and a lot of people don't know that about those kinds of plants. And so they taste it once and think, oh, I cannot eat that. <laughs> but, you know, if you catch them before they flower, they're not nearly as bitter. That's a plant, I would also plant say, mechanism. If you have, um, if you really, you know, Weeds are very opportunistic, and if you let them go, they're going to take over. So if you want room for your what you know, you're intentionally planting, then you got to keep a handle on it, whether you're going to eat them or not, or you're going to chop and drop, or they're going to go in the compost, or you're going to eat them. But there's, there's probably enough room for everything, but don't, like, and specifically, uh, there are some weeds that give an inch to take a mile, and you'll never get rid of them. So try and keep a handle on it. And I, I've, I wrote down a couple of um, indicators uh, that I just want to read of, of what specific quote unquote weeds mean in your garden. Uh, it's like a dandelion um, is, is uh, in, indicative of a well aerated and somewhat acidic soil. Mullen equals very dry areas. Clover um, is deficient. Mm -hmm. Clover is a, uh, uh, is nitrogen fixing and um, and it's already becoming perhaps fertile in that area. Plantain um, shows that we have low nutrient and perhaps low fertility, but, and I love that plant for um, making salves. Crabgrass uh, is usually in a moist soil and it's highly fertile soil. And yarrow is often dry and a, de a deteriorating soil, but also a great medicine. So they, you know, stacking functions. These, and that's you know, one of those things to understand about your weeds too, is that a lot of the invasive plants are actually medicinal plants. So if you understand, you know, if you dig in a little bit to herbalism, you will find that a lot of them have uses that will help you to decide how to manage them in terms of whether you leave some or pull them all out or what to do with it. But you can, you can pull any of them out of the ground and drop them as fertilizer right next to the plant and generally speaking that's giving the soil something it needed because it was able to grow that plant in the conditions it had and draw up nutrients into that plant from the soil that it could access at that point in that state that it was in. It's, it's yeah. probably a good idea to get um, like a Peterson's guide of, of, of weeds, I mean, uh, I mean uh, flowers mm -hmm. <laughs> and then because most of those Peterson's guides are you identify through the flower Mm -hmm. And then from there, have another cross-reference for edible, flat, for edible um, plants and another cross-reference for uh, medicinals. There's also so tons happen. of resources like groups on Facebook for plant identification and things if you need them. And there's also mm -hmm. an Eat the Weeds page, which is pretty cool if you're into delving into weeds and understanding what are edible and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 Future is also an incredible resource, which will tell you all of the many historical uses of whatever plant you're trying to grow, whether it was used for fiber or dye or medicine or whatever. I'm putting it into the chat box right now. Yeah. Plants for Future, it's British, but they have researched uh, every plant under the sun. I think it's pfaf.org, but I'm not sure. So just look it up under Plants for Future. It really is a, a great reference. Um, I use weeds as mulch, my principal mulch. I just take off the reproductive parts and put them back on the soil. And that way the nutrients that are embodied in the weed will go back to the soil. So um, I also do ethnobotany on weeds. So if anybody wants to dig into that, contact me. I'm writing up another manual on it. 
Um, okay, next question. Great. Um, the, the next question is about composting. It's from Anne. And the question is, it's a little bit long, so bear with me here. Um, what do you think about trench composting? I have a community garden and I'm trying to improve the soil. I have been digging in compost all winter and it seems to have helped the soil. Another question. Last year when I watered my garden, the water would not penetrate the soil. Instead, it would just pool up on the soil. Will the trench composting help this? I live in a townhome and I have nowhere to compost and I'm not really set up for vermicomposting. One thing that I just want to add real quick for myself is um, I also, I live in a condo, but I do do vermicomposting just in my hallway. And um, it's actually really simple. It's really clean, no smell or anything. And I started it based on the book, Worms Eat My Garbage. It was a great resource for me. Um, but that I think that maybe you, it is possible. I don't know the situation, Anne, but I've, I've done it successfully indoors. So yeah. I'll let the panelists take it from there. The, the trench composting is a lot like chop and drop. It's just a, um, that you're burying it a little bit, which can sometimes keep certain kinds of rodents out of it or that kind of thing. So in a condo situation, it's probably a great way to go about that. But ultimately, the more you incorporate plant material into that soil where the water is running off, the more that soil is going to absorb water into what was plant material that's going to function like a sponge instead of having it just roll off the top. So in that situation, you need some you know, impressive mulch to retrain some moisture, and then you need to incorporate as much biomass from whatever plants you have available as you can. And that's going to really improve that soil for you. Right, not just heavy, wet uh, uh, greens. We want some browns in there, like some uh, twigs and leaves. Yeah. Things Paper. that are already dry. The Things that are really <laughs> easy to find around here. <laughs> so um, just before we get to the next question uh, and before we run out of time, I wanted to encourage everybody to just try anything. Just get busy. The important thing is to get your hands in the dirt experiment and be observant. Um, I, I learned a lot about plants by starting them inside. So seeing what they look like at every, um, at every point in their life, when they come up, when they get their true leaves, when they start to get bigger, when they fruit, um, when, um, when we decide to eat them. And uh, I love that Bill McDormand said this. This is our, um, this was our seed teacher. He said the food that we eat is actually immature because a mature plant is, is already going to seed, right? So we need to know the plants in all of their stages of life. And if, and it behooves you as a gardener to save seed, at least some seed, so that you can see a plant uh, through all stages of life and, um, you know, be a keeper of the seeds. It's the right thing to do. Next question. Great. Um, so this question comes from Rachel. And Rachel, I apologize because I think that you actually asked this earlier too and I skipped over it. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so the question is, can you suggest some guild ideas for a small suburban yard? I'm in the Burbs and Broomfield, zone five. Well, like I have a fairly small suburban yard and I'm still doing an incredible amount with it. So, I mean, I would plant a fruit tree and then grow some grapevines up it that, that thrive in this environment. I'd add some mint plants because the bees absolutely love them. Um, I'd plant some clover because it's an easy, low ground cover nitrogen fixer. Um, in general, Comfrey is a great addition to most things because it's a really deep tap-rooted thing that, that brings up a lot of minerals and you can use that as a chop and drop. So that combination right there might be a great little guild to get you started. But it depends to some extent on what you want out of the food from the spot or, you know, what your interests are. And I would add also you can, uh, if you'd like to, you can add some Colorado native plants, either perennials or annuals. Um, and help the pollinators go crazy. And I'll, I'll type in the, um, the website here. And yes, many of the good bugs that you want are attracted most to the local, you know, native plants. And so, because it takes nature a long time to catch up and develop predators for things that are non-native. So in our lifetime, it probably won't happen. So the more native plants you've incorporated, the better your overall like pollination is gonna be and the access to predator bugs that eat the nasty bugs and those kinds of things. 
Great. Um, so here's another question. I think this might be a good one to end on unless anyone has any other questions. I think I made it my way through all of them, but if not, just speak up. But this final question is, um, are there any successful permaculture projects larger than home scale in Colorado? Well, the Rocky yeah, Mountain yes. Permaculture Institute is huge and like they're using um, underground heat exchange basically to heat greenhouses where they're growing like tropical fruit at altitude. I mean, it's really an amazing project. You can, you can go Google it and find all kinds of um, YouTube videos about it and things. He it's also a wrote a book. Idea. Yeah, Austin Towski. It's a um, greenhouse sure. grow. Um, can, can one of the permacultures, Judith or or Micah could uh, write Jerome's name in here and, and possibly the title of his book. Um, Cause I do want, I'll, I'll tell you about another one too. Um, one of our longtime permaculture teachers from Boulder, Marco Lam, who is also a Chinese medicine practitioner is now in Steamboat on 700 acres. Uh, he's, he's just become a farm manager there and he's gonna permaculture those 700 acres. And he's wow. taking one year to do observation and just observation and talk to the people uh, around. And he said he practices also what is called lean farming, L-E-A-N farming, where you lean into what people want. <laughs> like he's getting to, <laughs> he, and, you, and you lean into what the land wants. So he's taking a year to, um, to just gather information from the land and the people about what that land wants to have on it as a permaculture farm. Cool. I also have a friend, Michael Alcazar, that I've done various projects with and working on a Million Trees for Colorado project. And um, he's a permaculturist and a Native American, and he's done some really large scale stuff in terms of helping people to set up um, green growing enterprises. And he's, he's about to start on one for an ex-movie producer, I believe. Um, out past Erie that's that's a big whole site redo of a fairly large plot of land so I mean there's various people who are doing it here um, it just hasn't you know kind of made it into everybody's awareness yet and I actually just saw one more question come in if that's okay um, what are your recommendations for watering do you what do you what do you have to say about drip irrigation um, in terms of watering, like uh, at my house, um, I do use a drip irrigation system where I try to get the tap water that I use as close as possible and use as little as possible for the things that I'm doing. But I also then harvest roof water. When I, we had a bad hailstorm a few years back and when I had all of the uh, shingles replaced, I had him replace it with an upgraded shingle that is rubber with um, gravel over it. It looks just like an asphalt shingle, but it's not going to expose you to the chemicals from asphalt. So I also harvest that and slow it down and spread it out through um, soaker hoses and old hoses that I drilled holes in that I spread out all over the place so that it's making it to the places where the plants are growing and I can slow down the rate in the giant barrel and have it spread out over a couple of days instead of all coming down during the you know desert thunderstorms we get. I'm also a big fan of drip irrigation and rainwater collection. And, and I want to say, remember fruit trees and nut trees, um, because those are big, big perennial plants that provide a lot of food. Um, and they also, uh, drip irrigation is good for them too. Um, but don't, it, when, yeah, just remember the fruit trees and the nut trees. They will be very useful. And be brave yeah. about exploring. You can eat your grape leaves. I mean, there's lots of things that people don't realize are edible parts of plants. And so be a little bit brave and explore some of that and figure out what all of the edible parts are. A sweet potato plant is entirely edible. You can eat the leaves in salad, for example. I can grow you? garlic and you can eat the scapes off of that. Lots of good stuff. I, I want to, um, I just want to end by um, encouraging people to, uh, start peeking in the back alleys and talking to your, you know, looking over fences and engaging your neighbors and perhaps, and sharing the harvest. And if you see abandoned trees, perhaps um, at least harvesting, if not helping maybe perhaps to restore it or, you know, do some guerrilla gardening and throw some seed bombs and talk to your neighbors about sharing, sharing the harvest. And perhaps if you can't, if there's something you can't grow or you don't have room to, ask your neighbor to grow it and then trade, 
trade fruits and vegetables. But um, this is about all of us. You know, it's not just about our yard. It's like, how can we engage our community? And, um, and you know, going back to the principles of permaculture, you know, it's fair share for, for everybody. And uh, there are two questions I wanted to, to take. One was uh, from Lisa, can we grow fruit and nut trees at elevation? I'm at 8,300 and we have an orchard. We have not had a lot of success with nuts, but they, they've recently come out with some high elevation hybrid nuts that we are trying again. But we are successful with fruits, um, apples and, and plums and uh, not peaches, uh, <laughs> cherries. Uh, Carmine Jewel cherry is very prolific. Um, and we have lots of different kinds of, of um, apples. And nut trees in, in Boulder, um, Boulder was a nut tree area as, as far as I understand. I would do a little historical digging, but um, anybody in Boulder know more about uh, nut trees there? And then maybe Wendy, you could say one thing about the Montezuma project. Oh yeah, so um, down in, in uh, Cortez, there's an orchard. Um, it's called the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Project. And they have, uh, it's a couple that have gone around and they've taken scions from trees that are, the, uh, that were uh, very popular and common to Southern and Southeastern, Col Southwestern Colorado, because we had many, many orchards around here. Fremont, Chafee, um, Cortez, I'm sorry, uh, Montezuma, Dolores, and they've grafted those trees and they're bringing them back uh, and they sell a lot of trees every year but it's they not only are they collecting them they're actually identifying them through um through uh tissue culture sampling and uh genetics and they're able to identify trees that were planted here 100 years ago um i know that uh they are they've got a big project or they're involved with um with boulder um, also in um, Basalt and, and Carbondale, and they just gifted Salida 20 trees. And some of the trees are from, some of the trees that we got were very common to being grown in this area. And um, the, Arc and, the Arc Valley Fruit Tree Network is, um, is going to see that they get planted in good places in Salida and bring it back, bring them back. They're, they're worth looking for. It's the Montezuma Orchard Restoration Project. Micah, do you want to say something quickly about Boulder Fruit Rescue? Sure. Thanks, Pam. Um, yeah, Boulder Fruit Rescue is an organization that 350 Boulder and uh, Community Food Rescue and FallingFruit.org and Boulder Bear Coalition we created that um, that organization together. It's now its own 501c3 organization. And you can find more information for anybody who's curious about it at fruitrescue.org, uh, www.fruitrescue.org. And basically you can sign up to either be part of a, if you live in the area or if you don't mind driving in, um, you can either come be a, a picker and you know a gleaner to go and pick fruit and um, or if you're if you live in the area and you have fruit trees and you need help you can organize um, you can register as a, a tree owner and have people come to your your home and help pick your fruit um, and basically what happens then when we organize these harvests is uh, the the people who help pick get to take part home, a third goes home with them, a third stays with the homeowner if they want it. Typically they've had their fill <laughs> and are just ready to share it. And then a third goes to people in need in the community, to the various food banks and other places like that. And any B or C grade, we call them apples or pears or peaches or whatever goes to different um, animal um, you know, farms or uh, you know, this animal sanctuaries or things like that um, that need them. And uh, there's a animal sanctuary that has bears that absolutely love them. And um, so, yeah, um, we encourage anybody, it, there's no cost or anything like that in being part of it. Um, and actually there is just next Thursday, the fourth, there's gonna be a workshop that, and um, it's uh, not a workshop, sorry, but a, uh, an event, an online event, that's a fundraiser for Community Fruit Rescue. And um, you don't have to pay to join, but, um, 
Woody Tash, who's the author and uh, founder of Slow Money, is going to be the main um, presenter in that event. And people can join in to learn more all about community fr fruit rescue and, you know, different actions they're taking to deal with the, um, the pandemic and to make sure that we're all being safe as we participate this fall. And so you can go to 350 Colorado's Facebook page or website to the calendar, and that's 350colorado.org to find out more and to sign up for that event next Thursday evening. It's actually, um, it is a happy hour event, 5.30. <laughs> so um, join with your favorite beverage at that time. And um, again, you can find it at the, and sign up and register at the 350colorado.org website. Thanks, Pam. Thank you very much, Micah. Um, is there anybody else who has any more questions or anything that you'd like to say? Or, and Amalfia and Wendy, any last things that you would like to say? I would say don't overcomplicate your life. I even have arguments with permies about, you know, the work that they put in. I'm like, you don't have to do that. Like, as a disabled person, you know, I have I have found the least energy intensive way to do all kinds of things and so it's okay to adapt and to experiment with that and to try throwing a packet of seeds at the ground instead of burying them and see what happens <laughs> you know so like be brave about it and don't don't fret too much and even if you get problems showing up be a little patient because usually nature will figure out how to take care of that itself after a little bit right and i would say don't get attached to dogma just like just get out and try things you know, uh, just observe your failures. And there's so much information on the internet. There's answers. To, just ask the Google and engage. And you know what specifically I would say is engage the elderly who've been farming forever. I mean, gardening forever. You know, the, that's a great resource that we should exploit. Just start talking to other people that are gardening. Everyone's got great tips. I learned a lot this evening. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you. I did too. It was really an, an honor to be here with you. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Uh, write us with uh, next what you want for your next steps. And thank you so very much, Wendy and Amalfia, for sharing your knowledge. And I would like to say one more thing, which yeah. is that I would just like to acknowledge in this moment that many of these tools and techniques and things that we're using in permaculture were born of the knowledge of Native peoples, and we owe them our appreciation as well. Um, for uh, while permaculture was a design system that was sort of overlaid over that information, without all of that native information, we would not be where we are with permaculture. So that's a really important thing to remember. <laughs> Thank Bravo. you. Thanks a lot on behalf Thanks. of uh, somebody about 80. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. If everybody wants to take themselves oh. off mute and say good night, that would be great. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome on the bus way an old guy and learn something. Awesome great. presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Right. Thank awesome. you so much. Thank you. Nicely done. All right. Stay safe and well, everybody. Thanks for joining. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, presenters. Y'all were wonderful. Thank you. That's true. Love y'all. <laughs>